Welcome to Tanak Talk. I am your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with episode number 107 of Rabbi Tobias Singer's Let's Get Biblical Q and A, coming to you from the United States. Rabbi Tobias Singer. Rabbi, welcome back. Always a pleasure, sir. Always, yes, always. Always a joy. Always a joy to be back. Definitely. So how does it feel to... Uh, uh, to when, when you're in, you know, your no home. No matter how that sentence ends, the answer is cold. <laughs> that means no matter how does it feel, the answer is cold. Because, now that wasn't uh, what I was going for. So, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was saying. Ahead. So you're spending so much time in Jakarta now with your basically there's your home, but now you're in your, in your second home, or you may consider that your primary home. How does it feel? Do you do you miss? Uh, when you're here, well, like when you're here in the states, do you like completely, totally miss being in Jakarta? Uh, does it hit you, or do you just like are you so enveloped with your family it just doesn't even come across your mind? No, it's fine. I mean, I miss my congregation very, very much. I miss right. the the classes we do, and uh, of course, obviously, I have wonderful friends and and uh, the best congregation any rabbi can hope to have. But in truth, awesome. I'll confess, I'm at my daughter's house right now, oh. and my. Uh, my son-in-law, my beautiful grandchildren, uh, my parents, and like this. So, and that's the big price I pay is I miss my family intensely by being literally at the other side of the globe. So, um, so I'm torn. Yeah, there's a, there, sure. my congregation is is a a family for me, and uh, I miss them. And I'll please God be back. Uh, mm -hmm. But it being having my little grandchildren around does very <laughs> if you're in indonesia don't take it personally my grandkids are gorgeous and they're so cute and i miss them intensely so no i feel good it's cold That's outside awesome. in indonesia obviously there's no seasons the question what is the weather like never comes up in java uh, <laughs> yes it does for me uh, it does for me a few what times it? <laughs> it is. in indonesia yeah. it's 85 degrees every single day, 365, and as long as the uh, earth doesn't shake beneath you, you're fine. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Excellent, excellent. I'll tell you. Oh, wow. Well, uh, happy Hanukkah to all you viewers out there. I uh, hope yeah. you guys are having a peaceful, um, a wonderfully peaceful um, holiday season. This is just uh, really uh, a unique um it was a unique change, <laughs> right by this is funny for for me. It was funny anyway, because uh, when we shifted from this, from celebrating Christmas back when I was a Christian, uh, and we switched over to Hanukkah, they were like, "What are you crazy?" I'm like, "What are you crazy? I get to do it for eight days. You get it for one. Hey, do the battle." Hmm. Yeah, but so. let me ask you a question. I might as well interview you for a moment. Sure. When you were a Christian, you had to have known that um, December twenty fifth. Well, the Christmas holiday was largely of pagan origins. I mean, Christians recognize this. They recognize the winter solstice. Uh, many Christians don't celebrate Christmas, but those who do recognize there's no way in the world that Jesus was actually born on that day. This is no sources for this. It's much, much later. If you, in fact, knew, I'm not talking about when you were six years old. I'm right. talking as an adult. How did you reconcile? I, I mean, it's, how did you reconcile celebrating a pagan holiday uh, with your religion as a Christian in your past life? That is a great question because, um, and okay, so I basically started going to church. Okay, first of all, background, uh, my grandfather, Baptist preacher, my Uncle John, Baptist preacher. My dad was a Baptist preacher, now Messianic rabbi. Uh, so, But I was adopted when I was uh, very young, like five or six, and so my, I was raised with my mother and stepdad. My mother went to church periodically. We would go with her when we could. I didn't start actually going to church until I was, uh, until probably 1995, 1990, after 1990. Let's just put it that way. Um, when I, and then after I started going to church, I really got serious about it. I was constantly, I, I, I really tried to commit myself to doing the right thing. So I was going to church all the time. I never missed. And uh, uh, about five years later, I really got serious. Man, I was look, looking for churches with their doors open to go and listen to their messages. And I was listening 24 hours a day. I would listen to preachers online and preachers on the radio because I was so hungry for all this stuff. You know that that never came up even once. Uh, we, were, we were not even one time we became I mean, and I, I went to a handful of churches, some of them small, some of them massive mega churches. <clears throat> well, actually only one mega church. 
But there was probably uh, 20,000 people at this church. Uh, and that would include the children, not just the adults. And, uh, and it never came up once there, not even there. Did you, I'm, just a question, did you, this is very interesting to mm-hmm. me, because I've never spent a second as a Christian. Did you, so did you believe that Jesus was born on December 25th or you just didn't care? No, we believed that he was actually born then. In fact, it wasn't yeah. until it wasn't until I started questioning the New Testament altogether uh, that uh, I started I started asking questions, and then that that had come up, which actually led me. That was the first stage that led me into the Messianic movement because they didn't celebrate Christmas; they celebrated Hanukkah. Uh, and it wasn't until then, which uh, to to today it was only maybe five six years ago. I can't remember now. But mm. all the way up to that point, like I said, it, it was never a concern of anybody. And then after I became Messianic, uh, and I would talk to other Christians about, well, why do you celebrate, you know, don't you know Jesus was born like in the fall, not in the winter, blah, blah, blah if he was born, you know, in a scenario. And the, the people I told him says, so who cares? I mean, that was the over okay. the overwhelming response was, I don't really care when he was born. This is when we celebrate it. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. And that was that, that was right. it. We just dropped it, you know. Interesting. All right. Great question. Great question. Okay. All right, Rabbi. Uh, we'll. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get the phone lines open. They're officially open right now. So call in with your questions. 855-95-BIBLE is 855-952-4253. I'll put that number on your screen uh, as soon as I find it. And there it is. Uh, so, yes, the phone lines are open. Um, okay. So, so you said, okay, you, do you have any family or friends that, that were really dear to you? Like really, really close friends that were actually uh, that were involved in Chris in, in Christian uh, or the Messianic movement at all, or you did comp- comp- yes, really, yeah, I do. Even to this day, I have friends who are Messianic leaders, or rabbis, whatever you want to call them, and uh, we go back. Some of them we go back maybe thirty years, and wow. we developed a friendship and. We had probably everyone's like, well, what, what are you talking about? Like, don't you? But with some of them, I don't want to read minds or anything, but and I don't want to divulge anything because it's a personal relationship that I have with them, and I would never betray that trust. Sure. Um, but, you know, it, it, they're married into it. I mean, they're, they're married into it. They have big congregations and so on. And... I don't want to use their words. I mean, but for them to leave means that everything, I mean, one guy has a large number of very significant degrees. He said years ago, he said to me, we were having, I've never, I don't think I never spoke about this on air. I have to be careful not to betray. So this is a very well-known person in the messianic movement, Mm -hmm. very well-known. And he has a, quite a number of PhDs and I mean from really from high up there and um, and we one night he came over to my home we studied and it must have been about two o'clock in the morning not kidding and he's and he he said to me what do you expect me to do do you do you think these were his exact words Am I supposed to open up a theology store? Hmm. Those were his words. Do you think I'm supposed to, am I supposed to open, this conversation probably happened 25 or 30 years ago. You know, I'm married, this is my world. I'm not going to, I'm not going to describe more because I don't want someone to figure out who it is because it really is. I cherish my friends. I'm intensely loyal and, and. I said to him that, well, if that's the case, then it's not real, because I only deal with truth, and it's it's not easy for these. Well, I think it's not easy. I'm just obviously it's much more difficult if you're teaching, if you're a professor, if you have a big congregation, if you're well published, if you're married, you have children. To walk away means you lose everything. Right, your right. wife leaves you. You you everything. You're jo- you're done. You're 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 done. I mean, and you've worked eight years for whatever years for your PhD and you did well and so on and to walk away now leaders do walk away and there are quite a few former messianic leaders um, very often when they do leave in my experience I'm not in my experience the messianic leaders who do walk away are very brave 
have a very deep love for Hashem and Torah, really intensely, and they can't betray that. Um, or and or uh, frequently, the mess. There is a a problem that happens between them and other leaders in the Messianic movement. As it turns out, this will come as a surprise to non-Messianic, those who have nothing to do with the Messianic movement, the Messianic movement has such in, in, internal inner fighting between Messianic congregations, it's really shocking, it's astounding. I mean, you have Messianic congregations that literally are at war with each other over territory, over whatever. And it leads to a lot of breakaways in the Messianic movement. Now, it doesn't mean that ordinary churches don't have fights, but the Messianic Messianic movement is really endemic. Sure, um, I mean it's it's much more than you would uh, find. It doesn't mean there's never a split among in Lahavdul among religious Jews that there ever is a breakaway synagogue. It happens, but it's not the norm. And the Messianic, it's very much whose territory, who's the one who gets to do which messianic leader gets to do the passover seder programs at the local churches which brings in a lot of money and they get the mailing list and so the, the point is that there's a lot of inner fighting that goes on this is this inner fighting that goes on behind the scenes between messianics is not visible to those to to religious jews it's not visible to the outside world but it is very visible to them, and therefore there's a lot of betrayal, and many messianic leaders are really get uh, are betrayed by their congregants and betrayed by other con leaders and so on. There's just a lot of schisms where there's a lot sure. of fighting around. That sometimes will lead people, leaders in the messianic movement to go, all right, I'm done. And when they're done, they go. When they go, they go with a bang. Because, and when they leave, they will tell me that all along, I always had the questions that I raise. Uh, that means that when I raise questions in Messianic, they, they're all struggling with, what do you mean Jesus or Yeshua is God and the Trinity? This is a really serious issue for them. They can't display those doubts as leaders because this is these are the very problems their congregants are going through, and they're advocating and acting as apologists, and they're acting as attorneys rather than jurors when, when discussing these subjects. Mm. But once they leave, then they're willing to say, yeah, these are struggles that I had, and when I was in the movement, I know my colleagues, when we went to this messianic yeshiva, we went to Fuller Theological Seminary, we went to Dallas Theological, went to Moody, wherever it was, to Fuller, to Nyack, Philadelphia College of Bible, wherever it is. They all said, yeah, we all were students were struggling with these things. But then they, they have to defend it, and certainly once, you, once a person is in a position of leadership in the messianic Christian world, so then they can't act as jurors where they're trying to decide. They have to act as an attorney in a courtroom, meaning they have to defend it. Attorneys defend their clients, whether the clients are right or wrong. And therefore, they're forced into that corner. But once they're betrayed in the movement, that happens sometimes, actually happens a lot. Then there's a big door open for them to say, all right, I've <laughs> lost mm -hmm. half my congregation or, you know, there's a major fallout. It's it's time for me now to act on the d serious doubts that I had and then to review the text and to return back to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This happens hmm. a lot. Wow. And they are initially, they are met with uh, an enormous amount of hostility. Um, and then people try to reach out to them to bring them back. But it ultimately, the outreach of their former co-religionists fail and then the hostility fail, then they'll just be cut off. They're cut off completely. They become an absolute pariah, which means the I love you and we love you it was always very conditional, and they become, they're excommunicated uh, altogether. Whereas I will tell you, and I don't know if the Messianic leaders are watching, but they know who they are. Uh, I'm friends with them. I would never, never betray them. So I do have that relationship with them. But once I see that they're kind of just in it, and they have access to my books, they have access to they listen to it, they watch blah, 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 then it just becomes between them and God because I, I have 500 videos up on YouTube and audios and 
they they have access to it. So what happens very strangely is that once I see that the person is in it and that there's a lot of other issues at play, not just Daniel 7, 13, and 14, and not Isaiah 3, but there's all these other externalities in play. So I then go, okay, you've got the information. It's between you and God. I, of course, I pray that they would repent. Mm. I am an intensely loyal person. That's just my personality. And I can't stand people who are, who, I, I detest people who are not loyal to in friendships and relationships and so on. So I remain their friends, but and we never talk about Christianity again. I got to tell you a story just quickly because on top of this, really a sure. fascinating thing. Okay. So one of these messianic leaders, and just to assure you, he's a very well-known individual. We were because we're on the topic. We were in. We went out to dinner, okay, at a kosher restaurant. That's what I'm going to say. And we were sitting and talking. And again, we go back twenty-five, no, back probably thirty years or so. Maybe who remembers? And uh, he said to me, we were having, out of, I don't know what, and he turned to me and said, you know, it's killing me. He said, you know, my kids, you know, you know, because his kids are married, you know, and they were raised in the movement. He says, my kids, they're, they got Christmas trees. My son has a Christmas tree in his house. It's like, and he's just going like this, you know. Right. And I look at him and I, I go, oh. What were you expecting? Like Lubavitchers? I mean, what were you like? What what were you thinking? I I say it in a way, not right. I mean, but I say, look, what what did you expect? Because that's what also does happen. Whereas the parents are f- fervently in the messianic movement, unyielding into the Jewishness of Yeshua and all that, and won't even say Christ will not identify as a Christian. Certainly not in front of Jews, maybe in the church, but they don't. The, the The children don't have that kind of passion, and the children very quickly move in are way into the church. Of course, marry into the church. The intermarriage rate in the messianic movement is, you know, uh, who knows, 80, 90 percent, no exaggeration. So the children, of course, move on, and they don't maintain that. Jew, that kind of Jewish ethnicity, culture, and so on and so forth, and they, and then the the parents who are messianic have been messianic for twenty or thirty years, are really appalled by the children's choices to join main. When I say mainline, I don't mean Presbyterian, but uh, evangelical conservative churches that are celebrating Christmas, have Christmas trees sent because the, the parents are absolutely shocked, but they they had it coming. So it's it's. It's, I do have those relationships, but never, they, none of them, this would shock people if they would see us together. Mm-hmm. And I sometimes we sometimes are in a restaurant and I go, wouldn't it be interesting if someone took a picture of this? Uh-huh. But uh, they once they sort of hint what's going on, or whatever it is, once I get the sense that it's not about text at all, the relationship takes a dramatic shift and we just become friends and remain friends, and that's it. And they never will bring up a verse with me again. Wow. Never. Right. Yeah. Never. That's, uh, that's very similar to kind of how things have been on my end of the world, too. The same thing. Even even with my own biological father, um, he it's like when we talk, it's very rare that we do. But when we do, he can never, ever discuss, like, Scripture with us at all, you know. And I think it's uh, it's it's... It's very eye-opening. I'll just say that. Okay. Oh, Rabbi, let's take this caller. Caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Uh, this is Muni from Atlanta. Hey, Shalom. Welcome to the show. What's the question for Rabbi? Um, so I wanted to ask, in the Hebrew Bible, there are uh, different personalities which are called God, like angels and judges, and, and Moses one time was called God as well. Um, as far as I um, know, this is like the Jewish agency principle, or like Shalia. And if you come to the New Testament, it seems that John, in verse 1034, seems to allude to this when he says that, reports to Jesus saying that, is, is it not written in your law that whoever was given scripture was called God? But my question is that, first of all, what is this agency principle? Um, I have little knowledge of that. And if this is something that the New Testament writers were very well aware of, then why don't Christians interpret the text where it supposedly says that Jesus is God using this principle? And if I may, can I just add one thing? Okay. Uh, Yeah, I just wanted to, like, thank Rabbi um, and and you. Um, You know, of course, Islam and Judaism are not the same religion, but when I hear you talking about God or any other Muslim scholar, 
I have no doubt that we are talking about the same thing. But I just wanted to like take this opportunity to thank you guys. Awesome. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And so, Rabbi, you've got the question under wraps. So the question is an in, in issue of agency. Um, okay. And what, what you want me to just we'll break this down? Yeah, yeah, reiterate the question. And, Kaller, thank you so much for calling in. Shalom. Uh, Shalom. Shalom. Take care. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay, Rabbi, go ahead. These guys are really sweet. You know, we have uh, so many uh, Muslim callers. And, and I will say this. I have so many Muslim friends from all over the world, literally all over the world, who say, Rabbi, be careful. We really, uh, we worry, worry about you. And I just want to say to you, thank you very much. You're very grateful. I'm very grateful for your warm wishes. Um, so let's rewind the tape because this is very complicated. This is can be complicated by one fact, and that is Tanakh is using language that we don't use this today. Tanakh is engaging in a conventional, in a convention that is unconventional today, but was very conventional. It was, it's all over Tanakh, so be careful. The, and that is that those who are speaking in the name of God are called God. Now, we don't do this today. In our, in our world, just what is convention is, it's not that what we mean is different, we mean the same thing. But uh, when we say today a prophet said, we don't say about the prophet that God said it. We say the prophet said it in the name of God. That's just conventional talk. So convention in Tanakh, when we say a judge, a true judge, a person who is decising law according to God's law, not according to man's law, we would call him a judge. But in Tanakh, that person would literally be called a god. Uh, you would find that in in Psalm um, in Psalm eighty two verse six. You would find angels are called God in Psalm eight verse six. Uh, you you'd find in Exodus chapter twenty one uh, where judges are called God in verse six all the way through verse eight. Now this is very important. This is where everyone gets into a lot of trouble, and that is. Uh, we don't talk this way any longer. And therefore, people might be, chas v'shom, God forbid, c- conclude that somehow there's this, these are uh, some sort of divine agency or something like that. Not at all. However, when something in this world reflects back the glory of Hashem, when somebody, let's say it's a Novi, a prophet, reflects back, the glory of Hashem by conveying over messages from the Almighty, blessed be his holy name, the creator of the heavens and the earth. So in Tanakh, he's literally called God because the Almighty, of, of the Almighty blessed be his, his holy name, um, uses this prophet as a vessel through whom to convey eternal truths. You can go to Isaiah chapter 7, very famous chapter, because Matthew will abuse it. But in Isaiah chapter 7, you'll find that in verse 10, when Isaiah, a prophet of blessed memory, is speaking to Ahaz, a very wicked king. It's a very famous very famous conversation. But when Isaiah retorts back to Ahaz, that wicked king, uh, it says there that God said to Ahaz, now, actually, God wasn't speaking. Isaiah was speaking. Okay, so therefore, it's, now don't, it's very, notice what I'm doing. I'm not using fancy words. I don't want to use divine agency and all these. The word, these words, divine agency or whatever, don't, do not exist in Tanakh. You be very, very careful. But it comes up in people's books. People write books and they use it. It's very important to understand that there is a, a difference in the, just the, what is conventional in the way we speak. So in Tanakh, a son of God, a child of God means that it is a person who is carrying out the will of Hashem on earth. That's all. doesn't mean anything else. But in, that's in the Jewish world. In the world of, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, bless his name, the world of, of Moses, a blessed memory, our great teacher, the, the great Novi, the great, well, anyway, so th- that's how we spoke. That means that when, when the Davidic kings that followed, who God will said in Second Samuel chapter 7, Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 16, that when they, that, uh, that I will, God says, I will be a father over them, over him, me referring to 
King Solomon, who was a prophet, who was a very great man. He was the author. He is the author of three books in Tanakh, three great books in Tanakh. He says, "I will be to my father." Doesn't chas v'shalom mean in the Greek sense? In the Greek sense, when it says that you're the son of God, it means literally the son of God. Meaning, it means that that Zeus. Jupiter impregnated the mother, like in the case of Hercules, in the case of the emperors, in the case of the mythical founder of Rome, Romulus, in the case of Pythagoras, all of them, they were in literally the son of God. To the Greek mind, the son of a horse is a horse. So the son of God is a god. You have to understand that. So be very, very careful. This now brings us back to what's going on in the John, and it blows, blows my mind away. Because this goes on in a very famed conversation in John, and strangely, knowledgeable Christians, really knowledgeable Christians, actually use this as a proof that early Christians believed that Jesus was equal to the Father, was the same as the Father. That, that means Christians, it's very important to Christians to, to illustrate, to convey, that the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine the, the, the doctrine of incarnation, the notion that Jesus was God manifest in the flesh and he came to this world in a, you know, and that's in the Christian Bible, which it is not. It is not in the New Testament. Now, there is there are ideas that God, Jesus is a pre-existent being, certainly in, in, in the book of John. We will find that in the, in the letters of Paul, certainly, but not equal to the Father. Never. There is, they're separate. The, now, later on, certainly Ignatius, who's a very early church father, is going to already express that Jesus is God. We see the trajectory of where this is all going. You could see that if you talk in the Greek language, that eventually you're going to find, wind up in Athens rather than in Yerushalayim, rather than in Jerusalem. So understand that in the ancient world, just one other point has to be said— because we live in a monotheistic oriented world that in the Greek in the in the Greek world you could be God, a god, but you don't have to be that doesn't mean you are the God. Meaning that they believe that in the Greek world they believe that Zeus was a god, in the Roman world Jupiter was a god. And then they believed in many, many other gods, all the way down a tier of gods. I have a whole chapter on this in Volume 1, going down to those gods who were like emperors, whether it was Vespasian, Octavius, they were all considered gods. They were all considered divine. But if you would say to somebody in the Greco-Roman world that, uh, that Hercules was equal to Zeus, who, who impregnated Hercules' mother, they, according to their their brilliant teachings, they would say, are you crazy? They're not the same. This is very important. They would look at you like you're nuts. Zeus is the big, big god. He's the one who's keeping all the planets running and getting everybody pregnant. And people didn't pray to Zeus. This is another thing. Zeus, he's too busy running the planets and running the whole big show. So if you wanted to pray that your wife would have, have a child, that you would go on a journey and uh, over in a ship, that you wouldn't drown, that the ship wouldn't wreck, that you would have crops, that you would recover. You had personal little gods, and they were sub-gods. You didn't there was no praying to Zeus. There were state ceremonies to Zeus on the big high level. People didn't go start praying to Zeus. So really understand this point. If you don't, you'll miss everything. Then we can then go in. We don't do this today. No one talks this way today. No one does. But in the Greco-Roman world, there was, a, there was the great big god, the very important. Then there was the... The gods who are a little bit less than that, and they're on Mount Olympus, and then we go down, 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 all the way down to the Son of God. Okay, that's very important. So they were not not all gods are created equal. You could be called the God, but you're not the God. Okay, got it? This is if you don't know this, just walk away from this topic because you will find yourself thoroughly confused. Now the Christian Bible, of course, is a Greek book. When I say Greek, I don't mean the language in which it was conveyed. I'm talking about it was a Greek mindset. And therefore, you could refer to Jesus as the Son of God, as you'll find in the incipit of Mark, the opening passage of the whole book of Mark. 
Uh, but that does not mean that he was God. You could be God and not God. So you understand all that? If you don't, shut this off. The show is not for you. You won't chop anything. Now let's go to uh, the text you're just talking about. And that is um, in John, John chapter 10, verse 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. Summing it up, you find the... Um, you find it very serious where Jesus, we are told, says, now, I don't believe for a moment that that Jesus ever said any of this stuff. Moreover, John is the last of the four Gospels, chronologically, by every account. So if, if Jesus was walking around saying that I and the Father are one, like, didn't whoever wrote Matthew, Mark, and Luke earlier than John, Paul, the None of that I mean Jesus really walking around Jerusalem saying things like that, and they all went, eh, it's not so important to record it. You know, I am the life, I am the way. What they, they would he's making he's making all these statements about who his he is. He's clearly way up there. Okay. I mean, Matthew, no, it's not so important. We'll, we'll ignore that. Going on two donkeys. Doing that acro that circus act, sure. Uh, he's saying, "I am the Father of One." If you see me, you see the Father. The answer is, this is a later development in a Joannian community. Let's just move on. So, "I and the Father are One." Many Christians will point to this text, saying, "Aha! Here you see in the Christian Bible that Jesus is saying that He is God. Okay, He is God." And I, what really blows my mind away, I'm not naming names, but I very I read. The works of Christian scholars, serious people, and they literally point to this text as saying that in some way John apprehended Jesus to be a God, that Jesus was identifying as a God. Now they know what I've told you. So they're not saying that these the Christians who wrote the book of the Christians who who contributed to the book of John believed in the doctrine of the Trinity or the the absolute equal none of them believe that the serious scholars unless they're very conservative but they're saying that jesus is clearly assigning divinity to himself divinity so the answer is this text proves the opposite and shows that the doctrine of the trinity and the doctrine of homoousia the idea that jesus was of the same substance of the father is a much later christian invention that occurred long after the christian the gospels that we have now in our, in our form were developed. That was developed later on, and it was affirmed in, in the Council of Nicaea in 325 and reaffirmed in Constantinople in 381 under the Emperor Theodosius, which is very important because Theodosius was the last Roman emperor to preside both over the East and the West. Getting back, the key is that Jews are, when Jesus makes a statement, Jews are picking up stones to kill him, right? And Jesus, we are told in the book of John, says, why do you want to kill me? Is it for the great works that I do? And they said, no, it's because you making, the Jews respond that no, because you're making yourself equal with God. Now, here's the rub. Here's the, the rub text. The, the Jesus then responds, doesn't it say in your law, you are God's? doesn't say in your law you are God. Now, when I ask Christians, what did Jesus respond? Very often they don't know. They're not bad people. These are very fine people. I'm not patronizing them because you can imagine I wouldn't be doing this if I was interested in... They don't... They're good people, but they don't think about what, what's, what John's view, what John's Christology is. Whoever wrote the book of John, what was he thinking? What was his view of Jesus? That's what Christology is. This text is a quote from Psalm 82, verse 6, where it says, I said, you are God's all the sons of the Most High. The text there is referring to judges, and as I explained to you earlier, that because judges, those who are meting out the teachings of God, the law of Hashem, are called God, this is again, we don't talk this way, but the Torah HaKadoshah, the Holy Torah, speaks about this constantly, and again, please read in the book of Exodus, chapter 21, Verse 6, 7, 8, literally, judges are called Elohim, same over here, because what they are saying, if they are truly loyal to the will and teachings of God, their mouth becomes a vessel for the teachings of Shem, and Tanakh calls them gods, but they are not gods in the way we would talk this way. But so what, now let's break down, 
Because what we're looking for in the book of John is we're not looking to find out what Jesus was like. There's no way you're going to penetrate John, the book of John, which is, when I say penetrate, I mean get through its it's a highly improved gospel, and it's layer of layer of layer of improvement until we get into this book that's written more than a half a century after the the crucifixion, probably in the year ninety. What? So what, all we're looking for is what is John's Christology? What is what is his understanding of Jesus? So his understanding is very clear, and that is that Jesus is a God in the sense that. Um, in the sense that judges are God, meaning because he's expressing the teachings, teachings of God, God he, he is, is like, like God, God in a Jewish sense, sense not in a, a Greek sense. sense. Moreover, Moreover, you see, when it, Jesus, we, we are, are told, told, says earlier on that I and the Father are one, one. So, so that doesn't, doesn't mean that Jesus is saying, saying John's Jesus is saying, saying that Jesus, Jesus thinks, thinks he's God, because the, the idea of being one in John's Christology doesn't mean of the same substance, doesn't mean in the sense of the of the Nicene Creed. It means it of the same purpose. We have the same message that I am representing you. In fact, we see this clearly in the same book of John, in the longest dialogue in the, all the, any of the Gospels, and John is, no, the book of John is different from the synoptics in that it just contains these massive dialogues, which is not, which is not found in the synoptics. Very rare. So in John, you have whole chapters of dialogues. In John 17, 11, we are told that Jesus is praying to God. Which is what? Who is he talking to? He's talking to himself. None of this makes sense. But he asked in John seventeen eleven. What does he say? He said, "Would it be that he's referring to the disciples as followers that they should be one?" The Greek word there is "en," as we are one. Well, there we go. Bingo. That he's not hoping the disciples should be part of a, a trinity. That they should be of the same substance. It means that they should be of the same purpose. Now. So, so therefore, therefore, what, what we, we find, find in John, John chapter 10, 10, verse 30 and 31, is very clear. And how bright Christian super scholars just somehow, I don't know, miss this, or because, you know, these scholars, incidentally, many, many of them are not only not Trinitarians, they're very liberal Christians, but they uh, sort of begin with the idea that there's, that John is presenting a an incarnation theology, meaning that Jesus basically was a divine being who, a divine being, be very careful with that, who comes down to earth in the form of man, as opposed to an adoptionist theology. I'm not gonna, I, don't I don't want to go, go far, far, I don't want to go off too, too far, far off here, because this will be, um, this will go too long. So, uh, but they, they somehow, somehow see this as I am the Father are one means that Jesus or John's Jesus is proclaiming to be equal to the Father. Nothing can be further from the truth. Then, then Christians will sometimes, you definitely have heard this, Christians will sometimes say, but the Jews thought that Jesus was claiming to be God. After all, they were seeking to kill Jesus. Right? So, so the, the Jews, Jews said, said, we are not stoning you for the great works you do, but that you make yourself equal with God. So they actually Christians... They're, they're taught this in seminar. They're, they're not bad people. So I don't want to But they actually will say, but you see that the Jews wanted to stone him. Well, why would they want to stone him? Jesus wasn't proclaiming his God. And this is not a great argument. This is a torturous argument because in the Gospels, the Jews are portrayed as being wrong about everything. They misapprehend everything. It's just the opposite. The Jews, and when I say the Jews, I mean the non-Christian Jews are wrong about everything. That's the key. So th that means the Jews are blinded throughout the Gospels. I mean, the language of 2 Corinthians 3, of the you know, veil over the eyes and the heart of the Jews and the scales and all that stuff, that's all over the Gospels where Jews just don't get it. So the fact that Jews think that Jesus is saying is God in John chapter 10 doesn't prove that Jesus was actually saying that. It's the opposite. It demonstrates that John is that John believed, whoever wrote this book, it's not the Apostle John, we'll, we'll just set that aside. Whoever wrote the book of John is not, is, is, is saying Jesus is not equal with God. There, John 17, 3, this is eternal life. They may know they, the only true God, and Jesus Christ will now said. The word only there in Greek is monos, which means that, means that word conveys that there is nothing else, that and nothing else. Well, that there's, there's only one God, and, 
and Jesus Christ whom thou said, well, well, that mean that's that that closes the book on all this. So the answer is the fact that the Jews are portrayed or characterized as a accusing Jesus of claiming to be God, that doesn't prove anything. It proves the opposite, because the Jews are, in as the Gospels portray, all the Gospels portray, the Jews are always wrong in accusing Jesus of things that he's not saying. They're missing the boat on everything. So therefore, the Jewish response to Jesus doesn't demonstrate that Jesus was claiming to be God. Quite the contrary, it's demonstrating Jesus wasn't claiming to be God, and the Jews are wrong about that, as they're wrong about everything. Somehow the Jews are wrong about everything. The Chinese are fantastic, but the Jews are wrong about everything. So getting back, you have to be very careful, children who, children of the Most High, those who love the Almighty God, those who worship one God and another. Be very careful with Tanakh. If you studied in Tanakh, everything I'm saying is rudimentary. Nothing is complicated. The judge the called God, an altar is called God. It does, you should, Jerusalem in Jer Jeremiah 33 is called God. It doesn't mean they should bow down to Jerusalem. It just means that the glory, Jerusalem is so holy that the glory of Hashem is reflected through Yerushalayim. That's all it means. It doesn't mean anything. Don't want to bow down to a stone in Yerushalayim. I think you're nuts. So, but do we talk this way? The answer is we don't. That we call people son of God. We don't today. No one talks this way. And therefore, you have to, whenever you're studying history and studying ancient texts, you have to completely be mavata yourself, which means you have to nullify everything you know about how to talk, and you have to s submit to the language of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the Torah, HaKadosh, in the Holy Torah that was given to us by Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher of blessed memory, and, and Yeshayahu, and Yecheskel, and Yirmiyahu. That's how they talked. And therefore, so be careful. Big warning. And if you don't, so oh, you'll be in enormous trouble if you don't have no training at all. I'm a scuba diver. I love to dive. It's not a difficult thing to scuba dive. It's not rocket science. But if you don't take of course, you're not certified to scuba dive, even though it's a very simple sport, my favorite sport, because it requires no work. The whole goal of scuba diving is not to exert yourself. I love it. It's a perfect Jewish sport. But the point is, if you don't take any course in scuba diving, you'll be dead in a second. You'll have a lung ambulance. God forbid, you'll be dead. Why? Because there's some basic rudimentary things that just are counterintuitive. I'm not going to go into it now, but those who are divers know that if you don't know what you're doing, and whatever it is, then you can get yourself, you can be dead in a second. It's the same thing with Tanakh. Tanakh is using a conventions that we don't use today. Be very careful. If you are Rangatan, if you're involved in learning, if you're Roshi Verubai in Roshi Verubai in Taira, means you're immersed in the slave. Everything I'm saying is rudimentary. Everything I'm saying will be known to any Jewish kid in the yeshiva. Anything. But once we, if you if you don't know, you have to be very very careful. Just like you would never do surgery if you're not a surgeon, you would never do it. You realize, even if you would read a textbook, uh, people do this. It blows my mind away. And would you ever do surgery on your on on, on something you care about it, it, because you read a, a, a Wikipedia article on surgery? You would never do that. So be very careful. Immerse yourself in the tire the way we're told in the book of Joshua, chapter one. Be gisa be But be careful. Okay. So the answer is that John did not present a Jesus who was in any way equal to the Father, but subordinate to the Father, but representing the Father. As it says in John chapter 5, verse 30, it says, I could do nothing of my own, but of the one who sent me. I didn't go and stick that in there. Well, why can't he do anything of his own? If he's God, the second person of the triune Godhead, he should be able to do anything. Else. He should do anything if you really believe in one God. The answer is that like Kasalka Adaita, it's Aramaic. It never went up on the mind of the author of the Book of John that Jesus was the Father. There was no that was never going to happen. Now, are later Christians in this third century? going to be stuck with problems like how do you, because they're already saying Jesus is God. And then there's also very various expressions of this. Tertullian's understanding of the Trinity is going to be a heresy at the Council of Nicaea, although he invented the word. But to him, Jesus is still subordinate to the Father. I know this sounds strange. You know, Origen as well. Origen was a brilliant thinker in the, th uh, a brilliant uh, uh, third century church. I mean, really, he was a genius. He was, in my opinion, he was the most, the brightest Christian church father. 
just in terms of his scope of his knowledge. He was a Hebrew, he was thoroughly uh, familiar with the Hebrew language. But his Christology on the nature of Jesus was not that he was equal to the Father. He would have been, his, he was considered a heretic. For He was so brilliant and he contributed so much to, to Christendom's thinking and so on that they, you know, he, he is highly regarded. But his Christology on the nature of Jesus is not considered orthodox. So the answer is John did not believe that Jesus was God. He believed that he was a God in the sense, because I don't want emails on the prologue. He was a God that he represented God, and he did not begin his that his being the son of God did not begin and his baptism, as we'll find in the book of Mark. It did not begin and his conception, as we find in Matthew and, and very clearly in the book of Luke. Uh, but it began sometime in the eternal past, and that's what the prologue is, is conveying. Um, so the answer is, uh, what we have to do, my, my sweet brothers and sisters who love HaKadosh Baruch Hu, who love the Holy One, blessed be His name, is listen, there's no no replacement for studying the words of the prophets. There is none. You have to fill yourself up with Tyre. You have to fill yourself up with the words of the prophets of blessed memory. It's the word of Hashem. Imagine you get a letter in the mail and you open it up, right? You take your mail in every day, you go, and the return address is God. God, <sighs> the Almighty, the Almighty. Wouldn't you read it? And if you couldn't read it, wouldn't you make sure to uh, get someone to quickly translate it for you, to read every single word? So I would say to you, sweet children of the Most High, that please, if you love Hashem, which if you're listening to the show, obviously you care, study Tanakh, study it carefully, learn the Hebrew, just so you're speaking the Lushan, the language of, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, Blessed Be He, and by studying Torah and immersing ourselves in the words of Hashem, it'll bring about the coming of the true Mashiach, who hated the Yomenu, quickly in our time. Thank you for that question. I mean, I mean, you know, you mentioned earlier about the um, uh, other places that mention you, you know, calling people gods or whatever. When well, English, of course, it doesn't use that, and there's going to be skeptical Christians out there who are going to watch this for the first time and say, oh, I'll just read it right here, and it, it clearly does not say gods. It says something else. So uh, just for uh, just for uh, quick clarification for those viewers, um, how important is it for them to double-check everything they read in the English? If, you, if you're relying on a translation, you're drowning. But is it? But there isn't is he? Here's so what their question is: Isn't Hebrew a translation? <laughs> I get that question isn't asked. Hebrew a translation? I of what? get uh, of the, of the Bible. I get that question a lot, and I'm thinking this is a joke, right? They don't no, understand. The Hebrew, yeah, no, tell us. The, the language of Tanakh is Hebrew. People say, "Oh, there's a little bit of Aramaic in Tanakh." There's a, a little bit in Aramaic as a sister language. I mean, it's very close, closer than Portuguese and Spanish. I'm talking about close enough that a Hebrew speaker could generally read Aramaic, and then Tanakh is, of course, using Hebrew. The the language of Tanakh is Hebrew. In fact, in Daniel, we have our biggest chunk of text that is in Aramaic from early chapter 2 to the end of chapter 7 actually says, because it warns you here we go in Aramaic it's not exactly what it says hmm. but now because it wanted to relate the conversation it's not germane to this to this point but just saying the Tanakh says warning warning. We, I want to convey over the conversation between Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar Daniel was a, a prophet of Kodesh Vator. he was a holy man and it wanted to relate over verbatim the conversation why there not in other places not germane but it says it, announcement, because it's going to be a big chunk of Daniel all the way to the end of chapter 7. Then from chapter 8, verse 1, all the way to chapter 12, all the way through to the end of the book of Daniel, it's in, again, it reverts back. But it tells you, we're now going to be speaking in Aramaic. But again, Aramaic is very, Semitic languages, of course, are, I mean, I could watch, I could listen to Arabic if it's spoken slowly. I can pick up any Hebrew speaker can pick up many, many, many words. If it's if a person has very good diction and slowly, it can be picked up. And certainly, yeah, it means many, many words. If someone's screaming across the street in Beirut and you're just going by, oh, I, can't, I won't get anything because they're talking, you know, <laughs> right. you know, you know, you know, a fast straight Arabic, there's no way. But Aramaic and Hebrew are even closer. And um, I mean, very so close that 
the Hebrew speaker you can read Daniel and just go slowly and see the roots and the roots are just their sister languages. So therefore the Torah is given in Hebrew. The world was created in the Hebrew language, Psalm 33, verse 6. And uh, so the Hebrew is not a translation. It's the original language of Tanakh. In fact, the word Ivri is uh, the word that was the name that was given to Abraham. It's a name through which prophets identify themselves. I'm an Ivri, uh, which generally is translated, I'm, oh, I'm a Hebrew. That's where the word comes from. And Hebrew means that you're on the Aver, you're on the other side, which means that Avram or Ivri, Abraham the prophet was in Ivri. That means the whole world was on one side. They worshipped idols, they worshipped the gods of Nimrod, and Avram was on the other side. The whole world was on one side, and Avram Ovinu was Ivri, means Aver. Aver means on the other side, like Aver Yardain, the other side, the Jordan. He was on, so you have one side, you have all the nations of the world, and on the other side, Abraham, who was but one, as we are told nice. in Isaiah. Right. So that's where it is. Awesome. Where. Okay, cool. We'll move on to this caller. Caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hello, um, I'm Ray, and I'm um, from Wyoming. Shalom, Ray, from Wyoming. Welcome to Texas. How are you? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. I'm pretty nervous. <laughs> that's okay. Don't be nervous. I'm People call in all the time. I'm nervous also. Everybody's nervous. There you go. There you go. We're yeah. Jews. We're used to nervous. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Ray. Um, so my 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 question is, uh, I, I need to build on it a little bit so it makes sense very very quickly. Okay. And um, so I'm I'm not Jewish. I'm nothing. You know, I I don't I don't know. But I've my life has been turned upside down, and uh, I've tried to follow Hashem the best I can. My life's been turned upside down, and, like, I, I can't help it. I'm just, like, drawn to mitzvahs, and I have to do them. Sorry, I'm trying not to cry. And there's, like, six other people in this state. I don't know if you've ever been to Wyoming, but there's six houses in a hotel. And so everybody knows everybody. And so uh, when 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 you start wearing seat seats and you start looking differently, uh, you, you don't have friends anymore, you know. And so I've turned my life upside down and my family's life upside down to try to be uh, close to God. And more mitzvahs, is just you feel more and more close. And so my I, I go about all this to, my question is, so I've turned my life upside down, and if I get the chance to convert and stand before a rabbi, I'll run him over like a Mack truck. There's nothing stopping me. But my question is, is like if I'm at a Pesach and I've turned my life upside down for for Hashem and I touch the stem of a glass as they're pouring the wine, how come I defile the wine if I've turned my life totally over to Him? That's asking a good question. Does that, does that right. make sense? So, yes. Yeah. That's a very good question. You're a very sweet man. I'm going to answer your question directly. Thank you. Okay. okay. Ray, thank you for calling. Thank, thank you very much. You bet. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Yeah, that's a really, really interesting question. That's a, all right. That's yeah. a very interesting question, but the answer is very simple. Okay. So, scripturally speaking, um, a person who's a Ben Noach, who accepts the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which means they embrace Judaism, and they touch wine, he would be able to drink it. It's not a problem. The Torah does warn that you can drink the wine of the nations, particularly in, of the seven nations of all idol worshippers. That means wine, the life, using wine as part of a religious ritual was was ubiquitous in all the pagan world. And therefore, one other thing, and that is the Tanakh and our sages of blessed memory, had, I want to use this word carefully, listen, don't misapprehend me, had respect for the how genuine idol worshippers were, meaning that there is Stam Sichus Akum What does that mean? If you see two idol where Akum means is an acronym for those who worship the stars. It doesn't mean Gentile, it means idol worshippers. If you see two 
idol worshippers, and you can't tell what they're talking about. They're all across the street, and they're having a conversation. So, stam sichas akum, which means you see two idol worshippers engaging in conversation. You can't hear what they're saying. You can assume they're speaking about their gods. That means that they're very committed to their religion. Just like we see in 1 Kings 18 and 19, those who worship Baal were very religious, cutting pieces of their flesh away in order to bring about the, 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 that their offering should be accepted by Baal. They surely were dancing and prancing and cutting themselves and bleeding themselves. They certainly believed it, and they were doing it. So in Tanakh, you have to understand that when the, it's, it's out of respect for the idol worshippers. In that, if you see an idol worshipper who's pouring wine, you can presume he's not doing it to have a drink. He really is thinking about his gods. And then it's forbidden. It's illicit. We're not allowed to have any benefit. Not allowed to drink the wine. It's also bahano. You can't buy it. You can't sell it. You can't use it for anything. You have to just destroy it completely. I'm going to say it again. Anything that is used for idolatry, whether it's an offering, whether it's what anything, is completely haram. It's completely forbidden. It's not only forbidden to eat it or to drink it, it is forbidden to have any pleasure from it. You can't sell it. It's also not like Paul, that who that that person who perverted the teachings of Hashem, who in First Corinthians eight goes on to say, Well, you can eat from a um, an animal offered to idolatry, contradicting Acts uh, Acts fifteen. Uh, excuse me, uh, contradicting Acts where they it was forbidden. Where we are told it's forbidden. So now Paul is so hey, you know the offering isn't anything. I know that doesn't mean anything. They're praying to nothing. They're, but what's wrong? Where's this guy get off saying such a stupid thing? Key point is the following: that. From the Torah, is at, if someone is a Ben Noach, someone's not an idol worshiper, absolutely, if they touch wine, you can absolutely drink it. Not a problem at all. However, this is very important, this is not from the Torah. We are very careful. As it turns out, we're careful, just like, um, just like because when problems arose, I remember when Tylenol used to come in a capsule, and that's how you take, you know, Tylenol capsules, and people who had a headache would take it. But one one murderer went into a store and bought a Tylenol, emptied out the capsules and put poison inside, and then resealed the box and put it back on the shelf, and people bought it and died. So, I, I was it, Johnson & Johnson makes Tylenol? I think so. Whatever it was, they right away said, enough, and they took it off the took off the capsules off the market, they made caplets, now you can't put it in, it just looks like a capsule, it's not really a capsule, on top of that they put extra seals and tamper proofing on top and top and top, why? Because it's being ultra, ultra careful with the physical body, al achas kama va kama, how much more so when our spiritual soul, so therefore there is an injunction that Jews do not drink wine that was poured by someone who isn't Jewish. But I wanted to say it, this is a tradition of the Jews, or it's a rabbinic injunction. We don't say it's from the Torah. It's forbidden, because you're not allowed to add to the Torah or take away. But a person could say, look, I want to be extra careful. Okay, be very clear, because I'm going to get 500 emails on this with Deuteronomy 14. So people are going to say, Torah says don't add to the Lord, no take away. That means I can't say that this is from the Torah, but there's a rabbinic prohibition upon even someone who is a, a completely evil Ben Noach. Someone worships one God and no other that we don't drink the wine when they touch it. If it's an unsealed bottle pouring up, we don't. That's But we don't say that's from God. It's just an extra precaution that we take. Now, although it's 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 usher is forbidden to drink it, it's not usher bahano. If a person who's a Ben Noach, who worships one God, no other, touches wine, we know it, you can sell the wine, you can do that. It's not forbidden in having any pleasure from it. You just can't drink it. So the fully, now you go, well, how, I, I know, I just know I get these questions. It's a fair question. I want to explain this. And it's it's not really a nuance, but people somehow blank out on this point. So listen up if you got this question of how could the Jews add, Okay. Let's say you're in the electronics business, okay? You're you're in, in that field, okay? 
And every year in Las Vegas, at some convention center, they have a, a big convention on the newest electronics coming up by Samsung, by Sony, by all the big, by Canon, whatever it is, by all the big companies, right? And what happens? Representatives of your business go to Las Vegas and you stay at some big casino hotel and that's where the convention, and then you go to the convention. And let's say someone says, you know, um, there's no prohibition anywhere of going to Las Vegas, but I know it's a place that's called Sin City for a reason. And there's many, many temptations in Las Vegas. And I know that there's, it's not good. And not only that, I know one of my coworkers, you know, uh, she's, you know, been sort of a little too friendly with me. And therefore, or he's been a little too friendly, I'm not going to go to Las Vegas. I don't want to go. Why? Because even though it's not forbidden to go to Vegas, I place it on myself. I just don't want to be in a place of temptation. I'm not going. A person is allowed to say that. They're not obligated to say that. But the Torah says, you should guard my commandments. So a person wants to say that. They're not saying that the Torah says forbidden to go to Las Vegas. They're simply saying, look, it's just not for me. Because I don't want to endure the temptations. I know it's a dangerous place to go to because temptations are everywhere. It's the same thing. So there are rabbinic injunctions where the Jewish people have accepted upon themselves something, and we're not saying it's from the Torah. We're just simply saying to be super careful that if a Ben Noach touches one, I mean, Ben Noach wouldn't be very careful, literally means a son of Noah, but we don't mean that. We, we say Ben Noach, the B is also capitalized. And it means that someone who has adopted the Jewish faith completely. That means they accept that there's one HaKadosh Baruch and they keep all the laws that all those who are faithful have to keep. So uh, there is that tradition that we do not drink that wine. That's it. Now, once we accept that upon ourselves, it's a rabbinic tradition as a protection we just don't go into we just don't go to las vegas we don't go to our rated movies we just don't we don't want to expose ourselves to that okay i'm not obligated to go to a beach in the southern france i'm just not it doesn't mean i will commit adultery but it just the tender people who are just faithful just wouldn't do such a thing right it's, there's no prohibition there. so that's the point i want to make that clear so therefore if a ben noach touches one you don't have to spell it out can sell it and so on, but we don't drink it. If the wine is unsealed, why? Because we accept it upon some. Once we do, then we, I will just translate it. We then, we don't make a distinction. We don't go, but you're an exception. We don't do that. Once it's the rule, that's the rule. Even someone is converting to Judaism and it's one day tomorrow they're going to actually convert and become a Jew, a Gerd Sedek, completely conversion. The day before they convert, if they touch the wine, they can't drink it. Now, there's an exception where wine could be boiled. I'm not going to go into that because that's not really germane. The day before they convert, you could sell it. You can't drink it. Ah, they're going to convert tomorrow. It doesn't make a difference. So that's, but that's a rabbinic injunction it's a fence around the in order to protect the integrity it's saying i don't go to vegas ah there's an exception no exceptions ah it's vegas but it's not where the strip is it's where the residential areas you'll never see the venetian doesn't make a difference we don't make a difference like public we don't we don't separate so that's the answer to the question once we make it a, the claw you saw the nation of israel and this is very ancient except upon themselves a stringency because there's no mitzvah to drink wine that's touched by someone who's a Ben Noach. So once we accept upon ourselves so that we don't change. There's a very important principle in Judaism also is mitoshnish, which means we don't change. We're not a religion that changes every day. We have a new deoctorans, a new thing. No. It's the same. Once we accept it, it's founded, it's locked in, and that's it. We don't go changing our socks every day. Today is white socks, a blue sock. We believe in this doctrine and that doctrine. We don't. We don't do that. We stick with it. Now, do sometimes new situations arise where we have to adopt a more stringent approach or a more lenient approach, not because the doctrine is, is changed, but rather the circumstances have changed? Of course, of course. There would have been nobody who would have said 300 years ago in the United States that was a problem going to Vegas. The only problem you'd have is there's no water because in the middle of a desert. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> Vegas changed, so therefore people do change their approach. I know very pious Jews who are in the camera business, who are work for big camera companies, and the largest camera retailers in America are are owned by very, very religious Jews. They wouldn't dare go to Vegas. 
that's it. They won't go. It does, they're not saying that it's forbidden from the Torah to go. They just wouldn't go because they feel that the place is a place of, of sinfulness. So that's it. So that's the answer. I want to explain the background, and I want to um, anticipate all the questions that might arise. I, rise, I, I deeply appreciate your questions. If you have friends who won't talk to you because you worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob alone and no other, I would say get yourself some new friends all right. <laughs> yeah, all right. you're mixing with the wrong <laughs> folks and uh, so i would just switch friends around anyways thank you for your your thoughtful question that's cool all right we'll move on to the next caller caller welcome to the show please tell us your name where are you calling from hi this is patricia sitting down here in montgomery texas oh hi patricia how are you mm. I'm fine. hi there patricia how are you I- sweetheart i'm doing fine rabbi pa- patricia um, can i ask you a quick question off- PJ, can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Has Rabbi sent you any kind of proof texting yet for volumes three and four? Please say yes. Mm, no. <laughs> oh, man. She's come my on. editor. No, he has oh, not. She and edited so volume not. one and two. So Rabbi, come on. You see in the book. I, you got to get on the ball. We need a volume three and four. Trust me on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> PJ, go ahead with your question. <laughs> Rabbi, yes. Go easy on me, okay? But anyway, so I am, <laughs> well, I'm still I'm <laughs> I'm still stuck on Malachi, chapter one, verse eleven. Okay. Um, I'm gonna pull that up. I can't hear the rabbi. Uh, let's see. Let me make sure. Rabbi. Hang on one second. Let me make sure I've got. Oh, here's why. Go ahead and talk to say hi, rabbi. Yes, okay. hello there, rabbi. You can hear him now. Yes. He's not talking now. Yeah, no, hold on. I'm still trying to figure out. There's there's a... Uh, oh, 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 I think I just figured it out. Okay, now say something, Rabbi. Hello? Okay, do you hear me? Yeah, Rabbi. Think... Yes, I'm all yours. Talk to me. Well, there's a lot of feedback, but I'm de- I'm determined to get this question asked, <laughs> okay. feedback or not. Gotcha. <laughs> I'm reading Mal- uh, Malachi. And I don't have any trouble understanding the, you know, what Malachi is saying in the context. But when I get to verse 11, it's like a speed bump, chapter 1, verse 11. And what's, I'm puzzled what's the by it because issue? I'm okay. puzzled by it because it says, it says that, at least in the English translation, it says the name of Hashem is honored from where the sun rises to where it sets and that the nations are offering incense and pure oblations. All the nations, it says, are offering right. incense. So here we have a picture that's just flip-flopped from what you just said about Abraham. We have the, the Gentile nations are all getting it, and they are offering incense and pure oblation, and the Jews are offering defective sacrifices and... <laughs> dishonoring the name of God. So what, how did we get the, where did this Gentile nations, how is it that these Gentile nations, I thought the Jewish people were the righteous ones and the Gentile nations were not. But this verse flips it around. Right. And That's are a very they, good question. Uh, were, the, were the Jewish people um, not the only mafias for these people were these people monotheists, or were they just adding their stem to their panoply of God? What is going on in verse 11, please? Mm. And what chapter was that? Help. Malachi, chapter 1, okay. verse 11. Okay, 11, from the rising of the sun. Okay, got it. Okay, that sounds good. Just real quickly, can you hear Rabbi now? Rabbi? Yes. Not, no, I can't. Really? I got it. There must be a setting here on my board. I must have hit a button on accident. I'll figure it out. Okay, thank you for letting me know. <laughs> shalom, shalom. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Interesting. I thought the other people were listening that could actually hear you. That's okay. Okay, Rabbi, go for it. Yeah. All right. So, uh, all right. So, we actually would start in Malachi, but we would re- um, back it up a bit. And this is the answer to this question is a little bit deeper than anyone would expect. First of all, as it turns out, 
we don't have a parallel text like this in any of the earlier prophets. It should be said immediately at the outset that Malachi was the last of all the prophets of the of Tanakh, the last. Uh, the three last prophets chronologically was Zechariah, was Haggai, Malachi, oh, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Those are the last three. So this is the, the very end of the of the Tanakh of the Hebrew Scriptures, and they lived. It's very important to know when did they live. They they lived and wrote in the beginning of the second Temple period. That means they wrote. After the base Hamigdash, the second temple was built. That means this is long after Isaiah. This is certainly, um, uh, let's say, nearly a hundred years after, hundred years after Jeremiah. Just about they were writing after Ezekiel, and they uh, were writing already after Daniel. So this is very, very late. This is the end. Okay, now. This something that happened very dramatically. This requires an explanation. So first of all, the text. I would, if I were you, I would walk it back, and I would walk back Malachi, but go back to Malachi chapter one, but go back, go back to verse eight, verse seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and what Malachi say is something unbelievable. And that is that the, this is a criticism of the Jewish people. And you should know one thing, that if a prophet did not criticize the Jews, it probably will not make it into the Jewish scriptures. The purpose of the Jewish scriptures is to heal the people of Israel, that they can be a proper light to the nations. And it is surgery. I remember when I was a little boy, if, if I got a cut or whatever it was, my mother would put iodine on it and it burned like crazy. But whatever it was, it was it burned, but then that protected you from infection and whatever else. And therefore, the purpose of Tanakh is not a history book. It's not to disclose everything that went on, but it is almost exclusively, especially the prophetic part, all the prophets, which... The book of Malachi is a part of it. It's the last book of the prophetic works, which because Tanakh is divided into three parts. It's the part of the, the Tanakh called the Nevi'im. The purpose of the prophets is to criticize the Jews. If, gonna, if the prophets would go, oh, you're wonderful. Oh, how nice you are. You're doing everything good. So how is that going to make you better? Never will make you better. And the prophets were not interested in saying that. They're not interested in, oh, you're so nice. Well, you saw this. Not interested in that. The prophets weren't interested in Why? Because they wanted to put iodine on. They wanted to do surgery. They wanted to produce a nation that would be, would live up to the standard of its mandate. To be Am HaNivchar, to be a, a chosen people, a priestly nation, a a, uh, a, a a nation that is a, a king of priests, a mamleches kohanim v'goy kadosh. Well, they were not at that standard. And the Jews, how are you going to be a light to nations? How are you going to do that if you're behaving this way? So just so you understand, if you study Navi, if you study the prophets, I don't. what I just said to you now is rudimentary. But many, many people read one verse somewhere, and that's all they read. Malachi is not a big book at all. What is it? Four chapters in the Christian world, three. Well, it's small. You know, the, I, I'm sure... I'm sure the vast majority of those who in the world who believe the book of Malachi is the word of God never read it from beginning to end once in their life. In English, in Spanish, I'm sure of it. And when I say the majority, I don't mean 52%. And you know it, I know it. So that's where trouble comes in. A person's going to go into a book. I need to say this because this is, if you can sum up how everybody gets into trouble, it's, they're not reading the text, they're reading one passage that's quoted, and that's it. And then, of course, they're going to be drowning. So the first thing you have to get through your head is, if it's not critical of the Jews, it's probably not going to be included, unless it's a messianic prophecy, because the prophets are saying, essentially, I've got to criticize you and tell you you're messing up so badly 
But you need to ultimately rise to the occasion of Isaiah 49, verse 6. You have to ultimately rise to the occasion of Isaiah 43, verse 6. You ultimately have to be the light of the nation. You have to rise to the occasion of Isaiah chapter 42. I Meaning you have to become this nation of, of Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. That would bring in of, of Zechariah 8.23 and 10, 10, 10 of the Gentiles of different languages will grab the shirt of a Jew of different nations world and say, take us with you, but we've heard that God is with you. And you teach us about God. Because, well, what, if we're messing up like crazy, how the heck are we going to make that happen? So that's why we find, just see so you understand, if you get this, everything else falls into place right away. Thus, you find in the prophets, whether it's Malachi, Isaiah, it's the same theme. If you don't get this, you won't get anything. That messianic prophecy and extreme criticism of the Jews are interlaced completely over, back, forth. I mean, you couldn't find a chapter in Tanakh, in the Jewish scriptures, that's more critical of Jews, Jews than Isaiah chapter 1. But look at Isaiah chapter 2. It opens up with the most ex ecstatic, epic, messianic prophecies of the role of Jews in the world. Well, how did you swing from banging the Jews over the head, you're this, you're that, you're that, to telling us about the most, giving us the most soaring messianic prophecies of what will happen to the nations of the world when they come up to your slime, go out of Zion and go forth to the law. Um, even Tzion takes a Torah, out of, out of Zion will go forth the Torah, with Dvar Hashem, Yishlaim, and the word of God from Jerusalem. Why, how are these connected? So, what the prophets are interested in doing is there are spiritual trainers. And what does the trainer do? Oh, you're perfect. No, the trainer's going, no, you're messing up. No, you're no good. You want to be that. You can't be that. If you don't do that, no one else will be able to do it. What's the good of, of grabbing the hem of a Jew if this Jew is, is, is messing up badly? Okay. So therefore, just generally speaking, the most important sketch, thumbnail sketch of the prophets is heavy criticism of the Jews intermixed with Messianic prophecy because they're interlinked. If the Jews are going to ultimately trigger the re restoration of the world to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you can, you're in deplorable condition. And therefore, Malachi is going to go, look at you. I mean, he goes, and this is the only, basically, the only time we find talk like this, basically. Because in the time of Malachi, there was already a tremendous turn among the nations to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We see this also in the book of Ezra. We see where there are many people who came from the ab abomination of the nations, and they came and they wanted to gravitate toward the Jewish people. In history, why is beyond the scope of this show? When the Jews endure tremendous persecution, there is enorm it is followed by an enormous amount of conversion and interest in Judaism. It's crazy, but it's true. Why? Beyond the scope of the show. After the Holocaust, the, the, the worst persecution we've ever endured, uh, unimaginable. Today, they're lining up. They, people want, all over the world want to convert to Judaism or became, become B'nai Noach by the millions. By the millions. It's just, it's not easy. It can be done. But today, there's, it's in... Everybody knows that there's never been a time in history that such as this. How come anyone would want to join us now? We just went through hell and back. The answer is that something is triggered when the Jewish people go through suffering. It can be on the scope. What's happening here is Malachi, our context is the second temple has been built. And Malachi, again, is interested in what? Oh, you Jews are wonderful. You're the best. You're number one. I love the way you're doing things. Well, what good is that going to do? How is that going to make someone better? If someone has an infection, are you going to put, what, a nice, uh, nice uh, creamy um, massage oil on it? No, you're going to put on it things that, are, that will kill the infection and will, be, will, will burn. So uh, here we have a staggering criticism of Jews. So when the second temple was built, which means the Jews, not all the Jews, but let's say roughly 50,000 Jews had returned from Bavel. They're called the Sheva Vetzion. And under the leadership of Zerubbabel and, 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 and Yehoshua ben Yehoshua Zadok, these two great men, one was from the Davidic house, not a king, 
uh, the governor, and the other was is was the high priest. Great Jews came, some fifty thousand Jews to return to Eretz Yisrael in a number of waves. But the key point was, so they had a temple, but it was there was a tremendous interest in Judaism at the time, and there, this is. Well, you see this over and over again at these trigger moments. Tremendous interest in Judaism. So much so that the nations of the world were also offering their sacrifices. We're going to see incidentally, if you go to the end of the book of Zechariah, literally the end. So we say, I don't remember the verse. You don't need to. Just the last verse of the book of Zechariah, which is Zechariah 14, verse 21. It says that openly, this is a messianic passage, that the kings and the nations will be bringing offerings in the messianic age. So I'm paraphrasing. But in Christianity, by the way, that can't possibly happen. Um, Hebrews 10, 18, Romans 6. But we're going to set that aside. The key is, what is happening in Malachi is that it's not just the Jews who are affected by the return of the children of Israel to the land of Israel and the building, rebuilding of the base Hamikdash under the auspices of great giants, great Nevi'im, such as Ezra, Nehemiah, great, great people. That's the period we're talking about. At that time, Judaism, the faith of the children of Israel, was going up, up, up. There was a tremendous interest in anything Jewish, similar to today. Similar to today. Today it's even on a much larger scale. But similar to today. And during this time, Goyim were going, oh, look at this. They rebuilt the base Hamikdash. It was a time of the Persian Empire where Judaism was popular. And as a result, the Goyim were bringing sacrifices. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu was going through the prophet Malachi. He was going, well, look at this. You Jews, you're bringing animals that are sickly, crippled animals. And look at these the nations, Goyim, who are bringing offerings to the true God. That's what was happening. They're bringing the best of the best they had. And the Jews are bringing really not the best. You could do much, much better. You're not behaving the way he Hevel did. You're not behaving in the way to bring the best that you have. And there could be no greater shtach, that's in Yiddish, there could be no big greater criticism than you Jews who have the Torah, you read the Torah, you have a tradition going down from Moses of blessed memory, you have everything, and look at you, look how you're behaving. You you, you could be so ashamed, and there really is no bigger put-down that we can give is that the game are bringing animals that are the best the prized animals that are very healthy and you bring a tzakrach in an animal that's in a cast that has a headache that was just in a car crash and because it's a fashtir tzakrach in animals so Malach is just going get it together come on now bring the best that you have raise yourself up there's a tremendous opportunity now the base Hamikdash has just been built and so on now that's what prophets do Prophets are surgeons. Surgeons cut, but that's what causes radical healing. And then if you look at the book of Malachi, the end ultimately is if you go to the end of Sefer Malachi, what will you find there? You find the coming of Elijah the prophet, the coming of Mashiach, the Meher of Yemenu. But you have to understand the context. The context that you have to always, whenever you're studying passages, you got to know when did the prophet live? When, who was he talking to? Who was his audience? What difference does it make? If you don't know when Malachi lived, you have no idea what he's talking about. If you don't understand when this event occurred, you'll go, what's going on over here? Why would Goyim, the nations, bring offerings to the true God? I didn't read anything about this in the book of Joshua. The seven nations, when Joshua came into the Holy Land, were certainly were not bringing offerings to the true God. But in this period, they really were. Now, there's one other point I know I'm going to get from the scholars. I have, Baruch Hashem, thank God, we have some Jewish scholars who watch the show. So there is one point I'll bring in. I'm not going to go into it because it's too complex. It just is a whole other show. But at that time, the Anshe Knesset Agudayla, which means the men, I'm just going to say this, I'm not going to go into it. The men of the great assembly, this was an assembly of 120 great sages. They weren't just sages, they were prophets. They, they be, this is discussed in the Talmud, they beseech the Almighty to reduce the intensity or to, to destroy the desire for idolatry. Doesn't mean it was altogether destroyed, but it was essentially 
to recede it, to pull it back, because so, it was overwhelming. And the Almighty, I'm not going to go into all the details, but it, it from that point that they God withdrew, there was during an earlier period a tremendous, tremendous desire for idol worship, which is really hard to understand. But there was. At that point, they began a kind of orientation, not monotheism as in radical monotheism of Judaism, of one God and no other God, not that, but there already was in place a movement that there was a one God, great God. That concept was already there, as we see reflected in the um, in the in the in the in certainly in the vast literature we have from the Greek Empire. Now they believed in many gods, but they already were oriented that there was a great God and there was the highest power, and the lower gods really were did not have their power from themselves. That was a Greek concept. I'm not going to go deep into that. That orientation will change very critically at the time of the end of the Babylonian exile and when the Jews will come in. Gentiles are now much more interested in Judaism. We see, as I said in Ezra, where the people who are coming from the abomination of the nations and they were wanted to joining the, the children of Israel. You see it in, in Tanakh. And at that time, already, Goyim were getting really, it was like a, it was mamish, literally, a, bnei, a Ben Noach time, where there was tremendous interest in Judaism. Goyim, meaning the nations of the world, were bringing karbonos, sacrifices, to the true God. And the and Malachi was smacking the Jews. says, but that's all they did, was smack. If it's not a smack, it doesn't need to be in Tanakh. We don't need in Tanakh, oh, your Jews are number one. No, none of that. It's the purpose is it's a surgery room, it's a hospital, it's to make you better. And when make you better in a the hospital, they put needles in you and cut open sternums and 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 spread this to open their chest because it's not there to make you feel good. You want to feel good, you're not gonna get any, you're not gonna become a better nation, you're not gonna live up to the mandate. So that's what Malachi is saying. So that's the context. And I just beg everyone, study it carefully. Sure, you have a good teacher, but look at the text yourself. Understand who Malachi was, when did he live, and now we'll explain. Then you'll understand. Aha! Now we understand what's going on, and it should be that the study of the holy prophets, of the prophets who are kedushim, who are holy, holy people, will bring about the repentance of the world and the coming of the true Mashiach from Harimena quickly in our time. Thank you for that question. I mean, I mean, awesome. Okay, we'll take this next caller. Caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. This is Sean from hey, Sean. Libby, Montana. Hey, Sean, welcome back, man. How are you? Long time no speak. <laughs> and I'm good. Good, good, good. What's the question for everybody? Okay, so I'm going to... One of them might be a little bit too lengthy for what's remaining on the show, so I'm going to give two and then actually, two. actually, Maybe pick your let's pick your that one. Let's stick yeah. with one that's tight and short. Pick your primary one and let's go with that one. The real tight one. Okay, I'll just I'll go I'll go I'll go with one then. That's fine. Okay. Okay. So, um, the other day I I saw on a post on Facebook um, about someone questioning human beings or life before Adam and Eve. And of course, my instant inclination response was is that it was unbiblical and it wasn't presented in Genesis, right? Well, they private messaged me and told me that I need to learn my Torah more and basically stated that the, the sages for many years have taught that there was human life before Adam and Eve. Wow. And I would like clarification on this because I, I don't see that in the Bible and I want to know if this is something that Judaism accepts, okay. Orthodox Jews. Gotcha. Okay, Sean. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay. I'm going to cover this briefly because this is a, a, a very huge topic, and it's most widely misunderstood. There, first of all, it's not mentioned. This is not mentioned anywhere in the Torah. And anyone tells you it's in the Torah, whatever. It's not a good idea to rely on this person for their sources. It's, in fact, not. This is nowhere in found nowhere in Jewish literature. But there is something. There is a number of texts that are, appear in our Agadic literature, which means literature that's not necessarily meant to be taken in a literal sense. Very often, it's parabolic. It's stories, and that's how uh, information is conveyed. It's a type of wisdom literature and just like in the book of proverbs it's talking about wisdom walking down the street it doesn't mean literally wisdom had feet and walking down the street so they're not using a language that is conventional 
is someone is it forbidden to take such type of literature in a hyper literal way no but it, it's um it, the point is what to learn from it it's not it's i have to say this or else people are going to be just you know flipping out watching this so there is a kind of literature that we're supposed to learn something from and not it, it just doesn't, I can't say we're not supposed to take it literally or not. It's just a person who's well-trained doesn't. Doesn't mean it didn't happen at all. It Maybe it did happen. We're not interested in that. We're not interested in the mushal rather than we're interested in the nimshal, which means we're not interested in the parable and getting, well, did it go like this? Did it walk like this? How did it go? Did I have hair like this? Not interested. We're interested in the nimshal. The nimshal means not what the parable is, but what we're supposed to learn from it what are we supposed to derive from it not get caught up in the story because then you'll be totally distracted what interest is it to us uh now th th there were any kind of being before other Mauritian. now the animals certainly were created before adam uh adam is was a a human being and he was created with salam alaykim he was created from the clay of the earth and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed be His name, blew into His nostrils the Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of Hashem, whatever that means. And every person is created in the image of Hashem. What does that mean? We don't know exactly, but you should know when you look at the face of a human being in some immeasurable way, in some, uh, in some indescribable way, you're looking at a reflection of of the holy, of the divine. There's a divine. When you're looking at a squirrel, you don't see it. Look at a cat, you won't forget about it. You can see the glory of God in all of his creations, of course. But the, the, the human being already is B'Tselem Elohim. We don't know what that means, but we kind of do, because we know that human life is, is there's something holy, and that's it. And we're not, this is not our field beyond that. Now, the Medrash discusses that they were beings, not human beings. This is very important because when we mean human beings, we mean this. That they were beings that were created before the world was created that were either, because what are we? What are human beings? We are a combination. We are made up of two things. We are ma made up of both a of the clay, the earth. That's where the word Adam comes from. Adama, the earth. and But we are also created, B'Tselem Kim. we're created in the image of Hashem. That means that we have the, the breath of God within each person. We are created that way. We don't, that's why we don't walk like, like dogs and cats who their head and their tail, their front and their back are on the same level. We walk upright, a head here, up here, and our body here, and we're Connecting to Almighty. No animal ever believed in God, only human beings. Now, was there ever a being that existed before Adam that was all, um, all uh, amorphic and a spiritual being? Was there a, a being before Adam was created that was only earth clay and no spirit? So the, the medrash that talks, there are midrashic, there's midrashic literature that talks about it and how they messed up and God had to destroy those worlds. Now, I personally do not believe that that occurred. I believe that's a metaphor to explain to us that such, if we weren't both physical and spiritual, then we would literally, then our existence could not take place. And there, and I find this concept embedded in scones in so many beautiful parables in the medrash it doesn't mean that if someone wants to believe that literally there were bodies that did not have that were not infused with the spirit of hashem that didn't exist that they're they're her heretics they're not permitted to believe it but you can't allow that kind of teachings to in any way interfere with what the Torah says so they were not human beings meaning like us Meaning we are a com combination. That's why when ha only when Hashem created men, only in Leviticus, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, everything else is God is creating, God is creating. But when he came to men, it says, it says now say Odom, let us make men. Who is God saying us to? Who is he talking to? His neighbor? No, he was talking to the rest of creation because man is made up of not ex nihilo from nothing, but rather man is made from clay and the spirit of Hashem. 
So Hashem is summoning together all these all these two uh, things together to create man. Now, if man was pure angel, let's say what angels are made of, that means they're completely, we'll call them divine, because right now I can't think of a good word for it, or something is just behema, it's nefesh achai, not neshama, but nefesh, which is any living thing, so that thing would destroy also. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu destroyed all those worlds. It does not, again, this is complicated, I don't want to spend a lot of time in it, it doesn't mean that we should take this in a literal way, because it's not that kind of literature. It doesn't mean it's not true, and I will say also that I'm not the spokesperson for the Jewish people, but frankly, religious Jews don't sit and think about this a lot. But they weren't, meaning we just think about the idea that we're supposed to take away from that. It's this combination that can produce, a, that can, has the potential to create a good, great world. We don't separate the physical from the spiritual like Paul seeks to do and the way the Greeks sought to do, where they believe in, the, in a dualism, that the, that the human body is garbage and the human body is just a highly imperfect vessel i mean if you read cicero's republic uh six four you'll see he described that and they would laugh at the jews that, that we thought that there would be a resurrection from the dead with physical bodies resurrected they thought that we jews were insane for believing that why would you ever want to go back to a body this is the way the greeks thought they they and they thought jews were out of their minds for believing this um, and this is incidentally the kind of this is the how Greek Paul is in First Corinthians 15. He was espousing a thoroughly Greek concept that what is resurrected is not the same that once lived. So the key point is that's what we're supposed to take from it. We're not supposed to take from it necessarily that this is reading. We're not reading history books. We're not reading Barbara Tuckman. We're not. We're reading the we're reading text in this case midrashic literature. It's not found anywhere in the written Torah, anywhere. We're reading midrashic literature, and the point is, what is the nimsho? Which means, what is are we supposed to take from the parable? Not getting caught up. What the parable did it go like this and it was like that? You're not supposed to get caught up. You're getting distracted. The point is. <laughs> what is it? What are you supposed to take from? What's the teaching? Not get caught up in every detail of a of a of what is what is generally would be regarded as a parable. Well, perhaps not. Maybe many people take this literally. But if we do, we don't get sitting. People who do take it literally. I didn't do a survey on this. I'm not going. But what what kind of toenails did it have? And who was walking? And not that. I didn't just that. What you should be interested in is, okay, the ideal world in a perfect state is where you have the physical and the spiritual sewn together, drawn together, and the purpose of mankind is to raise himself up, to take the physical and raise it to the spiritual. Don't divorce yourself from the spirit, from the from the physical. Don't go and being celibate and all this with Paul you know, talks about how lofty this should be, that I wish you could be like Mary, but it's better to be married than to burn. No, nonsense. Enjoy, have a beautiful wife. Enjoy, have a good food to eat. Make sure it's kosher. Make a blessing over it, but enjoy it. Combine, raise the spiritual, physical to the spiritual, just like Jacob saw in the letter that connected earth with heaven. So therefore, those texts are not human beings, but they're referring to... Uh, they are referring to beings, okay, we take out the word human, that were that had one quality or another quality of what we are today. And the purpose of it is not to tell you history of the world. It, that's complete heresy to believe that. It's trying to convey to us that the world that is successful is a world that combines both together. And only we take the physical and we offer it up to the spiritual and we combine it together, then we can serve Hashem properly. That's all. Thank you very much for that question. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to move to, this will be our final question, uh, and this is one that uh, I, I was not able to catch the phone in time, so um, I'm going to play this sound bite. Hello, Rabbi. My name is Jeff Herman. I'm sending you this message from uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. I know, eh? But, uh, Rabbi, thank you for taking my question, and my question is this. What is the general agreement amongst rabbinical school of thought uh, in advising a Ben Noach coming out of the church and uh, as to where they should go or what the what community should they be a part of in the event that there is no Ben Noach community uh, in the small center like Saskatoon? 
Uh, Rabbi, I asked it. Are you are you hearing this? Okay. Not at all. Really? I don't hear a thing. <clears throat> okay. Um, I sent you. Uh, uh, I believe I sent you the same question. I'm gonna keep playing it online, but it's the one about the Ben Noak, the guys from Canada. Could, uh, could you just play it and have, put the mic there, and I can hear it right through your uh, mic? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good idea. Okay, hang on one second. Let me let me start this over real fast for a second. All right, let me do this without it. Hopefully, it won't feed back too loud. We'll see. Hello, Rabbi. My name is Jeff Herman. I'm sending you this message from uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. I know, eh? But, um, Rabbi, thank you for taking my question. And my question is this. What is the general agreement amongst rabbinical school of thought uh, in advising a Ben Noach coming out of the church and uh, as to where they should go or what, the, what community should they be a part of in the event that there is no Benoa community uh, in the small center like Saskatoon. Okay, interesting. Uh, Rabbi, I, I, I asked this. this. Okay, Maybe we'll see that. <clears throat> okay, we'll have to save that for next show then. Okay. <sighs> okay. Um, well, shucks. Let me uh, tell you what. We might, we've, we do, do have... you want to take a second and try to play it so I can hear it? Yeah, let me... Uh, okay, give me an idea how I could do that because I've got the speaker, the room speaker... But it's coming through my microphone so loud it's feeding back when I turn it up. Let me, let me, maybe if I don't get so close to it, hang on, let me try it again. All right, one second here, bear with me. Okay, I'm gonna have to turn um, the main mic up, which is where you're coming in at, so that it can actually f go back into it. Okay, so bear with me one second, let's try it. This might work, actually. Replay. Hello, Rabbi. My name is Jeff Herman. I'm sending you this message from uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. I know, eh? But, um, Rabbi, thank you for taking my question, and my question is this. What is the general agreement amongst rabbinical school of thought uh, in advising a Ben Noach coming out of the church and uh, as to where they should go or what, the, what community you. should they be a part of in the event that there is no okay. Ben Noach community? Uh, okay, so basically uh, I could repeat it, or let's just do it next time if you want to do it next time. You said you still I can't hear it? do it next time and uh, you know, next show, and okay. uh, we can uh, see if you yeah, can play Yeah, I that. really don't know why. I mean, it was, it was strange that uh, PJ had an issue hearing as well, hearing you talk back and forth too, so some, mm. something must have come unplugged in between my computer and the soundboard. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so, okay. Um, well... Let me, uh, we, we've got time, we probably have time for, actually it's 11.55 now, we're really coming up on the hour anyway, maybe this would be a good stopping point actually. Uh, so I'll see if I can figure out why we can't get the sound back to your headphones. I'll have to try to work on that this week and uh, next week we'll be able to hopefully play it better. So, uh, but anyway, okay, so yeah, so there you have it folks. Um, um, okay, so before we hang up, before we disconnect, uh, again, if you don't have Rabbi's books, two volume set, let's get biblical. Um, you you just need to do it. There's no no other thing to say about it. This uh, uh, it's it's just loaded full of so many good topics. And as I mentioned with PJ earlier, uh, Rabbi, and I know you can test to this. Um, this we've covered so many questions, so many spin spin offs of these questions that are in here. That uh, yeah, it's it's <laughs> we could go back and watch the hundred plus episodes of Tanakh Talk and get all the answers, or maybe you could uh, uh, work your way onto a volume three. That's not a joke. <laughs> These folks are great. You got to get them though, and then go to the website. Uh, go to um, I was going to say TobySinger TV. That's also very good. OutreachJudaism dot uh, Click on the free audio tab. Find the correlating chapter titles with the chapters in the book. That's the best way to actually get the most out of this study with Rabbi Singer. And I will tell you this. Um, Friday at work, um, I went to the I, – I, I have your podcast downloaded on my phone. I've, I've mentioned that before. What you guys can do, if you want to do it simply, just go make a donation of any amount. And you can download, like, all – the entire series onto your, onto something you play through an MP3 player, like your telephone or a tablet or something like that. And so I was at work, and I, I listened to one of your uh, one of your story or one of your lectures, uh, the confused text and testimonies, uh, about three times, and then it kind of dominoed off onto uh, Daniel nine seventy weeks, and that was so fascinating. And of course, I was kind of working, so I wasn't fully paying attention, but I was paying attention mostly, and then something would distract me, and I had to go back and rewind. And play it. I must have listened to that thing like like ten or fifteen times in one day. It's just so cool. And the best thing about it is too, 
you can do that because unless you know it already, unless you already have it committed to memory, listen to this stuff over and over again, man. It's just, it's just, it's refreshing to know these answers when you have people saying things and what about this, what about that. You don't have to ask somebody. You can go straight to a, straight to a source. Uh, and Rabbi, your your books are an excellent resource for that. And I'm telling you guys, if you don't have it, you're missing out. Outreachjudaism.org. And so. Um, yeah, so there you have it. Um, uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, Rabbi, uh, thank you again. You're just an amazing, amazing Zodic, and I really appreciate everything that you do and your availability that you make uh, towards and for everyone here. And I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to go to, on the trip in April uh, to <laughs> to the Holy Land. So uh, if you guys are interested, look at uh, Best Tour, B-E-S-T-O-U-R, one T, uh, dot O-R-G, and you can find out what it's all about. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys there. So, uh, Rabbi, thank you. And thank you all for tuning in. Shalom, shalom. Take care, everyone. Shalom, Rabbi. Thank you.